program at MIT. Um, welcome, thrilled to have you here. We're gonna spend the next hour, um, part of the time we'll spend talking you through um, some details about the program, hopefully answer some of your questions, but then we've reserved time for roughly the second half of the hour for current students to come in and be able to handle and, and help answer questions that you might have through a Q&A session. So if I can get my slides to get started here. Um, just a, MIT is a wonderful acronym place. SDM refers to the System Design and Management Program. We are a professional master's program. It's split between the School of Engineering and the Sloan School of Management. Your degree at the end is a Master of Science in Engineering and management reflecting the fact that you're taking your coursework in both schools. We were founded a little more than 25 years ago, and it was done in partnership between M MIT and industry, and, and really where industry came to us and said, we have challenges today. There, it, It's impossible to design products or processes or services without thinking at a systems level, really thinking about those interconnections, those boundaries, how, how different technologies work together. And so this program was designed with MIT faculty to be able to help individuals develop systems level expertise, expanding skills, thinking about managing large scale complex projects. If we go back 25 years, a lot of the types of challenges we were seeing were things like aerospace, heavy machinery, um, military, those type of challenges. It's expanded today. And if you look at the backgrounds of our students, what you see is that Every industry, every area has those similar systems level problems. And our goal is to be able to develop your skills in being able to tackle problems regardless of the industry and area. Um, I'll talk a little bit more as we get going, but SDM is MIT's first degree granting distance education program. Um, it's not fully distance, and that's where I'll go into it in a little bit of detail, but I want to at least uh, make it clear that we've got some flexibility in the way the program goes. And to kick it off, and if I can get my YouTube to work properly, I'm going to run just a short video that I think gives you a, a, a nice student perspective on SDM. And we get to watch an ad for a second because this is on YouTube, so give me a half a second. Can you all hear? Not can yet, you give no. a thumbs up if you can yes. hear? Yes. I think we can't hear the sound. Yeah, Joan, I'm not hearing or seeing the YouTube video. It, we're still on the PowerPoint screen. Consumer products, we have automotive, we have aerospace, we have military. We really have a bit of everything. And I think that also is a huge- We can hear the sound right now, but we can- yeah, um, Diversity of thought. Read the video. Adapt to your different. So you can't see the video. You can only hear the sound. Different time zones. So That's right. Like... Okay, let me pause this. Let me try and see if I can redo this. Um, Ignacio, can you just let me know what you could and couldn't hear there? Because I it apparently wasn't working properly. Uh, we can hear Marcel. Uh, yeah. We cannot see the video though. All right, I'm going to restart it then, and I apologize for all of you. I should have this a little bit more smooth, but for some reason the technology is working. So give me one second. I'm going to restart this. And we're gonna see if we can get this running properly for you now. Let me take it back to the beginning. And if you just can let me know if you can see and hear this as we get it started, that would be great. We can see the video now. Perfect, sorry about that. As an engineer, I'm trained to be a problem solver. And now I've learned a new way to solve problems and it's pretty fun. It's almost like a puzzle with strings because if you move the piece that's over in this corner, it may pull the piece that's in this other corner and you had no idea they were connected. And that's the beauty of systems to understand these relationships between all these pieces. 
My name is Marcel Durenberger, and I'm a third year SDM, which is System Design and Management, master's student at MIT. System Design and Management is a blend of engineering and management, so we split our credits between the engineering school and the management school. It is a bit more engineering heavy, and we do have business represented as well, but we also have doctors that come in. We have geologists that come in, people from energy-related industries. We have consumer products. We have automotive. We have aerospace. We have military. We really have a bit of everything, and I think that also is a huge part of SDM to have that diversity of thought and you learn how to adapt to your different groups, adapt to different cultures. You have people in different time zones. So you're learning how to navigate that as well. And you can do it in so many different ways. There are people who come in as sponsored from their companies and do it very quickly. There are people who are sponsored who do it in a pretty standard year and a half to two years. Yep. There's a group of people who do remote with clauses to get on campus on certain times. And then you have the part-time folks. I was able to blend starting part-time and then going full-time. There are a few of us who do that. So core is the first year for every system design and management student. So in the fall, you're all learning a common language, the core foundation of what systems thinking is. System architecture usually leads the front and then you have system engineering and then you have project management. And you're applying these to pretty simple problems. So at first in the fall, you're like, okay, we're getting this new language, we're seeing how it applies, but these problems don't seem particularly complex. And that's the point because you need to build on it. So what happens is you have a winter session, one week in January where everyone comes on campus and you are all in a room, you're doing workshops and you actually get pitched projects from 40 plus sponsors. And these projects have all been filtered by the program to really help you practice all the knowledge you now have. And then you go into the spring semester and you apply it to a much more complex project. So that complexity builds across the core class and then it culminates in how do you actually take this method of systems thinking and apply it in your workplace or however you need to use them. Being a teaching assistant for the core class, it's actually really fun to see other people wrestle with the questions that you wrestled with and then slowly have the puzzle pieces like click in their heads the project work brings you closer, the whirlwind's nature of the program brings you closer, and then all of a sudden you have this really special community. I think we come here because we want to do better. We want to elevate something that you think can improve, and this is an opportunity to learn the tools and meet the people that have a similar curiosity and drive to make a difference. All right, we'll switch back over if I can do this properly here. One second. Apparently we're moving to the next video. Give me a half a second. I'm gonna move it over to the, I tried to embed everything in this time and apparently I did a really horrible time embedding, so I apologize. So let's move ourselves forward here. So. I think it's always important to reflect back on the mission of SDM, and it's really summarized and, and captured well by Tom Magnanti, who was the founding SDM co-director, is still on the faculty here at MIT, and he termed it, this is a program for those who want to lead, not leave engineering. We're not an MBA. We're different. We do have access to the business school courses, but we really are looking to leverage that technical capacity and background that you have to be future leaders in architecting, engineering, and designing complex products and systems. Um, we feel very passionate about this. MIT is a unique place where you have the best in the world in terms of engineering education, and you have one of the best in the world in terms of business education, and we're bringing those two together. And so if we look a little bit into um, what it is that we're, we're doing is we, we've talked about this concept of system thinking. And, in our mind, systems thinking is a holistic perspective and way of learning. It's looking at connections and interfaces. It's looking at, you know, when you think about an aircraft, it's not just optimizing an engine. It's thinking about how that works in concert with other parts and products. It's thinking about those connections and interfaces across that, that product or system. And it's looking at dynamic behavior. It's looking at feedback loops, how those pieces interact. 
There are two options in terms of a degree or, or education here at MIT for, for the system design and management program. We offer a, a traditional master's degree program. And the master's degree program, as you can see, has these red components to it. So it has this core class. The core class runs the full academic year, so fall, January term, and spring. And we cover system architecture, system engineering, and project management in that core. And then outside of the core, you have a group of management courses, foundational courses and electives that you've got the full uh, Sloan School catalog available to you. It's 100 plus options. Similarly, you have engineering requirements. You have engineering depth classes as well as electives, and you have over 200 options. You're not restricted to the background you have. So if you're a mechanical engineer, you're not restricted only to courses in the mechanical engineering department. If you have the background to be able to take a course as defined by the prerequisites, you're welcome to take courses across the engineering school. And then as a master's degree student, you have a thesis that summarizes and brings together your work here. At the same time, and as part of that core class, because you can see that commonality of the core, we also offer a graduate certificate in system design. That graduate certificate is full MIT graduate class. You are taking it with the master's degree students. Our certificate students are almost always at a distance, and so they're, they're synchronously connecting into the core. Um, but they're on teams with master's students. They're in projects. They're working together side by side. And at the end of the certificate, you run a capstone project. It's really taking a challenge you have in your workplace, and it's applying what you've learned here at SDM to that um, project. Runs through the summer. We actually kick it off in the spring so that you can start to identify what the project topic is going to be. But it allows you to take what you've learned back into your workplace. We are really at the intersection here at MIT. And so when you think about it, we are a combination of the Sloan School of Management and the School of Engineering, as I've talked about, but what does that mean? So within the Sloan School of Management, you have access to the courses, action learning labs, there are clubs, there's research, there's conferences. You have the ability to dig in and become part of that Sloan School community. Similarly, on the School of Engineering, Again, you've got access to all of the departments for both courses, but also if you are interested in research and digging in deeper with faculty on the technical side, you have the ability to work within the School of Engineering in research teams and labs. We see a lot of our students participate in research and teaching assistantship positions, RAs and TAs. These are not guaranteed. We can't um, align you with an RA or TA ahead of time, but when you come here, what you find is that faculty value the experience that you have from your work, um, professional work experience. And our students are very successful in finding RAs and TAs. And this can help cover your cost of your education. I do want to make sure that it's clear it's very, very difficult to secure something before you come. And so it's essential that you have funding to at least start your program. But most of our students that are looking for it um, are able to find funding to be able to complete their degree. Outside of those formal schools here at MIT, there is an enormous innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. In fact, the building that we're in at MIT, uh, east side of campus, we share with the Martin Center for Entrepreneurship. And so you'll often see people and our students float between our office area and our, our student space and the Entrepreneurship Center downstairs because it's an ecosystem where people are coming together that are interested in new technology and founding companies. We also understand that as a professional master's degree, the vast majority of you are going to return back into the workforce. And it's important for us to make sure that the education you're getting is relevant, that it matters for what you're, you're going to be stepping back into. And so we work closely with industry. We have uh, projects in the spring that Marcel mentioned in the video that we invite in industry and they present real problems and you have a chance to test out what you've learned on somebody else's problems. We find students do uh, sponsored research. They're doing uh, projects. We do tech tracks. We get out there and visit companies and get a chance to see how companies are actually implementing these things real time to be able to make sure that you've got that ability to be able to step back into industry and utilize what you're learning here at MIT. In terms of what our cohort looks like, um, 
we have, our students have an average of 10 years of professional experience, but it really is a bell curve. We'll accept students with as few as three years if you have an advanced degree or five years if you hold a bachelor's degree. But we also have people that come later in their career that are at a point of inflection that they feel they need additional education resources to be able to move up to that next level. We intentionally build this cohort to have a wide range of backgrounds, and that's both the industries they come from, but also the types of roles and positions that they had in their job prior to coming to, to MIT. Just under half are either partially or fully sponsored by their company. They don't get preference. We look at them the same way, but we often find that companies have an internal selection process that puts the best candidates forward. And so it's, it's a really nice blend that we have within the cohort. About a third are local commuters. They live somewhere in the Boston area. They may go a little bit slower in terms of their duration of their program because they're working and taking a couple of classes a semester instead of doing it full time. And about half of our students are, are US citizens, about half come from around the globe. And if you look at representation, clearly the dark for the US is rep, reflects the fact that 50% of our students are from the US. But we have students that come from every continent um, around the world. And we actively look for that kind of diversity because we understand you're going to go back and be part of global teams. And being able to understand cultures and work practices are really important around the globe. In terms of backgrounds before people come here, about half, in fact, this past year, it was exactly half, had only a bachelor's degree. I, I shouldn't say only, they hold a bachelor's degree. And about half hold an advanced degree. There's no preference either way. It's just, again, where people are in their journey and in their work journey, that it makes sense for them to think about coming back and thinking about systems-based skills. Um, in terms of industries, and, and these are self-reported by our students, and so you find places that overlap a little bit. Um, definitely technology and things like consumer goods can fall in those same categories. But you find, in terms of the industries that they come from, that we have a tremendous amount of diversity in the backgrounds of where students are coming from. Talking, shifting gears a little bit and talking about the curriculum of what you, you learn and what is expected of you as part of this master's degree. We talked already about this idea that there's a foundational core class. It's a full year course. Um, at MIT, we have a fall and spring semester, but we also have a January. It's called IAP in that wonderful acronym world, independent activities period. Um, but we take advantage of that with our core class to continue the education we've got through that January term. It's 15 units per semester. And I think many of you that may have come from a traditional American university, that credit system may seem to be incredibly high. And I think it's, it's worth taking just a minute to explain how MIT does um, educational units. Unlike a normal, a traditional school that may have a three or four credits per term, MIT's units reflect the number of hours that you're expected to spend both in and outside of the classroom. So in a 15 unit class, your expectation is that you're spending 15 hours a week on that course. And so you can think of it as a heavy load for a typical technical uh, type of a class, but it is a heavy lift for that first year. The goal is to give you a broad and deep systems education. And we use what we call a spiral approach so we come through when we introduce those concepts and Marcel talked about this a little bit in the video and, and talked about how it's simple. It's not particularly complex when it comes the first time. And then it comes back and we get to see it in more real world situations. And we dig in again and it gets a little bit deeper in terms of your knowledge, your understanding, but also how you're approaching those problems. And then we come back a third time with that spring project and give you a chance to test it out again with the, the support of mentors and faculty, but also the company that's proposing that project. The class is a combination of in-class discussion, more of your tr typical traditional lectures, but we also bring in industrial experts. There are team projects, there are individual assignments, and it does culminate with this semester long integrative team project. Now, if I can figure it out this right time, and I apologize for the last time, I'm gonna pop up one more video, and then you're gonna hear from Brian Mosier, who is the lead faculty member on our core class. And he's gonna talk a little bit more about the goals and intents of our curriculum. So give me one second here. I'm gonna pop it up. 
Oh, you should, it's Today, not me for real. It's actually a video. Actually a video. We're going through cool. an energy transition. Yeah, so let me pause it. Computation, new platform. Classes of automation and robotics, hardware and software are back. At the same time, what's happening in medicine, precision agriculture, carbon reduction. All these transitions are happening, which means that there's so many new combinations, new opportunities that rising engineers can address. STM was a program in the graduate schools of engineering and the Sloan School of Management at MIT. It offers both a master's degree in engineering and management, as well as a certificate in the same. Our students are at mid-career. We have students from agriculture, from energy, from biotech, health, aerospace, from automotive, from governments and military in one classroom. If we looked at curriculum a century ago, each of the separate disciplines was establishing their own first laws and their own disciplinary principles. Today, the engineering problems we're working on are connected. That is, we can't separate the subsystem we're working on from the system it connects to. And that connected system lives in an ecosystem that includes other systems. So an engineering leader now not only must help coordinate and make trades amongst the engineering disciplines, but we must be capable of also interacting, having dialogue, having conversations with stakeholders, economists, regulators, lawyers, sociologists, ethnographers. So that becomes a central part of what an engineering leader for complex system problems must deal with. But let's start with the core because the core is really unique. We teach this class over nine months. With every few weeks, we spiral through system architecture, system engineering, and project management. These are three capabilities that an engineering leader especially for complex modern projects, has to have. Students are involved in hundreds of hours of activity, including 300 hours of team-based projects. We invite outside organizations, both companies and governments, to propose a problem. Students begin by simply trying to frame the problem. They then take that and understand it and decompose that system and understand how it might perform in function with different options and different approaches. And then they also think about what it means to then take this proposed system into the real world, the significant peer learning. Then there's also now a new vocabulary, a new way of seeing the world as systems and a whole toolkit of methods that people learn. After the core, there are foundation classes tied to systems, both in engineering and in management, it's also now important heading towards a thesis to explore. While at MIT, it's such an amazing place. It's like being a kid in the candy store. There's so many interesting classes, interesting activities. And so the electives give one a chance to shape one's own degree. And thesis is an important ultimate expression of the journey they've been on as a student, advised by a faculty member or a professional researcher. And typically it's a one-on-one -on -one dialogue over at least six months. What's always amazing to me is to see how a student evolves leading up to the topic in their thesis, which could be groundbreaking, maybe something they could never have anticipated when they entered. And an important part of the experience in being here at MIT is permitting that discovery, being open-minded, being diligent, interacting a ton, then allowing for the discovery and the shaping, whether it's a new technique, a new method, a new company that might emerge from the time period. All right, let me bring us back to the presentation, one second. Um, while I'm doing that, I think many of you already discovered that please feel free to ask questions in the chat feature. Um, we, are, we have uh, staff and faculty that are answering questions real time. 
We'll also have time for the Q&A at the end, but definitely take advantage of it while you're you're listening if there's things that are coming up. So Brian, Professor Moser talked about this, but just to put it in a visual, we have 36 units of that integrated core. You have 24 units, a minimum of, of 12 units in engineering depth and a minimum of 12 units in management foundation. And then an additional minimum of 15 electives in engineering and 15 electives in management plus your master's thesis is what defines the degree. Um, we've talked a little bit about this. I think that the key piece to remember is that there's choice. And so even in this management foundation, we're not going to say, here's the class you take for your management foundation. We're gonna say, here's a, a, a range of classes that you can pick again, that fits your background. And it's appropriate from our perspective, based on where you are in your career. There may be one person that has tremendous depth in an area and they can explore something different. And so what we find is that no two students have exactly the same curriculum as they go through the program. It's really customized, it's worked between you and your advisor to make sure that the courses fit your needs and fit the requirements for the degree. I spoke at the beginning and I wanna be able to make it clear in terms of what are the options because it is one of the most flexible degrees available at MIT. So on our master's students, we do have students that are on campus full-time, they come. Um, it can be done in as little as a year, although I will say that if you do it in as short as a year, there are sacrifices you make in terms of being able to engage in things across MIT. The curriculum is in intense, and so you're gonna be spending a lot more time in class. As a result, we recommend, and most of our students will take somewhere between 16 and 24 months to complete the degree. Um, that gives more time to be able to do that exploration, especially for students that are looking to pivot and move towards a different direction in their career. That also opens up summertime for internships to be able to build the experience that allows that pivot. We do have local commuter students, um, and we also have distance students. Now, a distance student in the SDM program or actually anywhere at MIT, MIT requires any student that's enrolled in a degree program to spend a minimum of one semester on campus. And so you can do the program at a distance, but you are going to have to plan during your time at MIT to be on campus for a 13 or 14 week semester at a minimum. And so that's something to keep in mind in terms of planning. It doesn't have a fully distance option. Um, in terms of the certificate students, we do have some local commuters that come in, um, but the majority of the students are synchronous certificate students that are at a distance. Um, the, for those that choose to do it at a distance, um, what many students do is they spend their first year at a distance while they're taking the core. They can be, they, they're required to come on campus in August for orientation. They're required to come back for one week in January for a intensive workshop week. And they're required to come back for about three days in May for final project presentations. But other than that, the first year with the core can be done at a distance. It is synchronous. And I wanna emphasize that, that the way the class is structured and the way the core is done is it involves, um, there's discussion, there's dialogue, there's work with faculty. And so it's really important that, you know, students are carving out that window of time, which is two hours, a couple of days a week, to be actually in the classroom, even if you're online. Um, the last part of it is that all Sloan classes are in person. And so it's not possible to take any of your management classes at a distance. Most engineering courses are also only offered on campus, although there are a handful that are available um, online. Um, this is an area that I think a lot of students are interested in and they, they it, it's a reason, you know, let's be realistic about why people come back to graduate school. This is the data from the, the employment surveys from last year, from 2022. And so this includes students that graduated between January and December of 2022. Um, I know it's always nice to look at those, those top end numbers. Um, and so you can see the range of where students' salary was prior to coming to SDM and then their salary upon graduation. Um, what we do see consistently is that there is a good solid increase. Um, last year, it was an average of, of about 66% on our students. And this reflects those students that are 
self-sponsored, those that go back to their company, we don't track the the salary data for those that have, have their company is paying and they continue with their same company. Um, in terms of job locations, we see this switch around a little bit year to year, but predominantly those that that are looking for jobs tend to stay in the US and it's Northeast and, and the West Coast that have the majority of the students with a smattering of, of students that go in other places. Um, these are the companies that over the past five years um, have employed students. It's not a full list, but it'll give you a little bit of an idea of the companies and the industries that have been active in recruiting uh, SDM students. Those that are in bold here are companies that have uh, hired multiple students. All of this information as well is on our website. If you dig in a little bit into um, outcomes, you'll be able to see this. And then I also think it's useful for people to take a look at what the titles were of students as their first job after they graduated. This isn't where they've gone in the long term, but this is the next step that they took as they left STM. And so it'll give you a little bit of a flavor for the types of roles and positions that our graduates are moving towards as they exit SDM. I've mentioned already and talked about the fact that we are a program that is a professional program by and large. There is a handful of students that continue on and do, do, do continue with doctoral work, but the majority of our students go back to industry. And so we work very closely with companies. We wanna make sure that, that it's reflective throughout your education. And so there's internships, there's site visits, there's sponsored research, guest lectures, team projects, all of that is a chance to be able to reflect what's happening in industry while you're here as a student. So with that, I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna introduce three of our students that have volunteered and have come on to be able to talk a little bit about their experience and primarily answer questions. I think what's most important is that you hear from them about the experiences they have. And I will say that we don't uh, coach or, or um, tell them what to say. This is, you're gonna hear them in, in their respective um, perspectives here. Um, I'm gonna ask each of them to give just a brief introduction to your background, um, what brought you to SDM, and a little bit about what you're focusing on if you're far enough along to be thinking about thesis. So Eduardo, are you on? I can't see the full list of names, but if you're on, do you mind jumping in and, and giving a quick introduction? Hi, Joan. Yes. How are you? I've been Eduardo? here. I've been here all along. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I just I just got here yesterday listening to what the program has to offer. Um, so I'll start with my background. Uh, I graduated uh, with a mechanical engineering degree from Virginia Tech and then went on to pursue a biomedical engineering master's. Uh, since then, I've primarily focused on med tech and biotech. Um, what attracted me to SDM, uh, I was in the in the Boston area, which was fantastic already. So I, I got to interface with a couple of SDM alum, uh, very friendly people. So please reach out. Uh, it really helped me get a sense for what the program was about. And I wanted to bring more structure to what I did. So I was primarily working in research and innovation. And and I think that I I... At the time, I thought I would benefit significantly from bringing more structure to my work, uh, a more sensible approach, and also exploring other areas outside of my uh, areas of expertise, uh, which at the time were microfluidics and material science. Um, and SDM uh, really, uh, really uh, exceeded my expectations in that regard. Um, so I've, I've since transitioned from a medical device company to a local biomanufacturing uh, company. It's a startup uh, spin out out of MIT, and and it's been a wonderful experience. Um, I I think I I I'll stop here, and I'll I, I've seen a gazillion questions go through the chat. So I, I'm you know that's my background, that's who I am, um, and and I'll let uh, others come up with questions that um, I'm sure they they'll they'll have a ton. Thank you, Eduardo. Hiroki, are you on? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, please go ahead and do it. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Yeah, yeah, quick introduction. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Hiro. I'm a first year master SDM student and I'm from Japan. And I'm prior to MIT SDM, I worked in the automotive industry. 
as a body uh, design engineer. The body is the structural parts of the vehicle. So mainly I was uh, working on the component parts, but uh, the purpose of uh, being the student at MHSDM uh, is to be a product manager, like the, uh, for example, the Joan, and you know, uh, told us the for and uh, you know airplane, uh, you know, not engine uh, uh, parts engineer, but also I, I I want to be a like you know entire product manager. So that's why I'm currently uh, at MIT SDM. I mainly focusing on be a uh, product manager. Yeah, I'm excited to be here and please ask me any questions. Thank you, Hiro. And Zach, I do know that I saw you um, flash up on the screen as part of the, yes. the candidate. So if you don't mind giving a quick introduction as well. Not at all. Good morning, Joan. Good morning, everyone. Like Joan said, my name is Zach Ballard. I am a first year student here with Hiro and I am active duty Coast Guard. I have been out of my undergrad in the Coast Guard for about 12 years. And I specialize in I said, civil engineering and Coast Guard operations of floats. So I've been all around the country working on that. What attracted me to SDM here at MIT was my sort of realization that everything that we continue to create in the Coast Guard or just in industry in general is getting more complex and I needed more tools in order to successfully be able to get all of those systems to, to talk and work well together. So my, the thesis that I'm, I'm kind of thinking about right now is, is how to use model-based systems engineering to improve Coast Guard decision-making when it comes to managing our shore infrastructure portfolio, so. I'll uh, leave it there and happy to answer any questions with Eduardo and Hero. Thank you so much, Eduardo, Hero, and Zach. Um, Ignacio, I know that you and, and Amal and others are keeping an eye on the chat. Are there some questions that you think would be um, better answered by, by the, the students that may be able to give that perspective? Yes, I do. Actually, one of the questions that is coming up uh, multiple times is, uh, what do we mean when we say leadership? Is it people management? Is it uh, managing large budgets? So uh, if you can give some insight into that, uh, uh, I think uh, people will appreciate it, guys. Eduardo, it might be good for you to start because you're you're in your second year and so you may be able to talk a little bit more about some of the things that you've been involved in. And then Zach and Hero, I'd love to have you join in as well. Sure, sure. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I think when, when I think of leadership, I think of, uh, walking into a room above the line. So walking into a room with an open mindset, uh, with curiosity, looking to learn, uh, and not, not walking into a room with, uh, commands for everybody in the room. Uh, and, uh, that's especially, I think the case when, when you're walking into a room with, with a group of individuals that are high talent, high energy. Um, and you, that, that's, that's my short version of it, uh, from a technical perspective, when it comes to leadership, I, I, I think SCM has given me the tools to empower, uh, a lot of my team members, uh, to grow in their respective areas and also to explore outside of where they are so that they can maximize the value that they bring to my organization. Um. Now, I'll just jump in if it's okay, Hero. One, one thought I would have is, you know, I think it's like Ignacio mentioned in some of the leadership discussions that you'll, you'll see or the requirements may be posted and that it's, it's really helpful to come into the program with that experience. Um, I think one of the places that I'm finding a lot of growth while being here, kind of like Eduardo alluded to there, is leading peers. And it's a lot easier sometimes when you're either in the military or at a company and you can use maybe a formal position to lead or manage or direct people to do things. But when you're, when it's more spread out on an even playing field, uh, I feel like there's a lot of growth that happens here when it comes to leading peers. And uh, when you come in with a little bit more experience 
from managing people or budgets or what, whatever it might be. Uh, I think it helps uh, set the stage with nice, nice context to continue to grow in that area. Yeah, I can jump in the several comments. Uh, for me, like data ship is everywhere. So, you know, it could be informally data, you know, also formal data ship. So it's, you know, everywhere. So like essentially collaborate with others. So understanding the situation well and uh, contribute to the situation uh, based on your, you know, knowledge, your scale. So that would be my data ship. Yeah, and, and maybe to circle back just real quick, I've had conversations with students in the past and they have concerns that they don't lead a team, you know, from as Zach mentioned, from an organizational perspective, they might not be a manager, right? Uh, I think a great example of leadership is those that can prove that they can lead up or manage up. Um, that's much harder, honestly, and, and a lot more productive. And I certainly value my colleagues that, that are able to influence upwards and, and get everybody on a much better situation because of their abilities to do so. Thank you all. Um, Ignacio, other questions that are um, surfacing, or, or again, any uh, Amal, Naomi, others that that may have seen questions that are. Um, so, well, I'm, sorry, uh, another one that's coming up uh, a little bit is um, uh, in terms of the level of, let's say, readiness uh, for mathematics for graduate level work, uh, because some people have been out of school for a few years. So, what would be your take on that? Like how. Uh, Polish do you have to be in your mathematical skills at this point? And I think all three of you are kind of in this situation where it had been a few years since you'd sat in a classroom. And so can you talk about your experiences of, of whether you felt prepared and, and what it was like to step back in the classroom here at MIT with high level kind of technical uh, requirements? I'm happy to start again. Uh... Definitely come in with with an open mindset. It, it is MIT, and and it is what you think. Some of the most brilliant individuals in the world, and and the expectation is that you're you're going to excel in technical areas. Um, I've I've had some courses where I where I've struggled. I, I think that's perfectly normal. Um, and and what I found is that your your peers are going to be very supportive. You're going to be stronger in some areas. And some of your peers are going to be stronger than others, and you just have to sort of lean on each other. Um, but it's it's part of the experience. Um, it's been great, honestly, just stepping back into a classroom and and getting deeper into some of the technical concepts. Yes, I, I, I agree, Eduardo. I, oh, sorry, here. I'll just I'll just add in here. You know, it was five years for me being out of my master's program. And what you know, twelve years from undergrad, so definitely dusting off some knowledge, clearing out some cobwebs. So you know, when you get here, allow yourself kind of like Eduardo said, you know, it's it's a challenging place, but it's also a really well resourced place in a lot of different ways. I mean, you know, the professors are willing to help. We have recitations which you'll learn about, and the TAs are going to meet with you there there are office hours the librarian staff here is out of this world with support and they're all specialized in different areas so yeah i wouldn't sugarcoat it and say that it's it's easy like we're all coming into it and we're all you know high performers and there's going to be some maybe pain but uh, i think it's it's doable there's a lot of support um that, that would be how i would summarize it I can add some information there. So as the both of them are told us, they, they are very supportive. And also all the almost all the assi assignment would be the team assignment. So we have to support each other anyway. So that would be a super helpful to learn each other and also, you know, go through the experience. We found that there's oftentimes advantages to having teams where somebody may be only a few years out of school along with somebody who's been many years out and you get the combination of someone who's fresh with their math and somebody who's got kind of extreme leadership skills from having been in industry for a while. And that's part of the beauty of the blend of, of teams and individuals. 
I do see a hand raised. Karan, do you want to unmute and go ahead and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, great presentation, by the way. So my primary question here is, um, I understand, you know, the technical requirements of, of this uh, program, and I understand this, the critical um, thinking, the critical thinking skills and the problem solving skills that we're going to be sharpening. Um, it is also useful as an engineer, and I've just found this in industry that if you're able to come up with those solutions, uh, think on your feet innovatively, and then also present well across a, a wide berth of, you know, experiences, audiences, it is very useful and because I've just found that engineers in general are some of the, <laughs> they, they're some of the smartest people who seem some of the most dumb people at the same time. <laughs> they just can't speak to the requirements or technical aspects of things in a way that other, the audience can understand. So I wanted to ask, is there exposure or is there, you know, a way to take on classes, say in business, public speaking, leadership, that sort of area with respect to these technical skills that we're going to be acquiring. And the second question is, I did join the session late. Would you be sending out a recording? Thank you. I'll answer the second one first, and then I'll, I'll put it back to our panel of students. We will have, this is going to be fully recorded. We'll actually be posting it up on our website, um, I think within about a day or day and a half. And so it'll be accessible there. Um, Hero, uh, Eduardo, uh, okay. Zach, anyone want to jump in? Uh, happy to. Uh, Karan, a, a excellent question. And and I think that is maybe where SCM shines above all else is you're not, it's going to be rare that you take a course where you don't have to come up with um, some technical content that you have to present to a wider audience. And it really polishes your presentation skills and your ability to communicate technical concepts very clearly, mm -hmm. uh, starting from requirements to uh, hypotheses or whatever it is that you're working on. Um, and, and that's, I think, a huge aspect of leadership, walking into a room and bringing clarity to all the stakeholders in the room. Um, I've loved that about SDM, and I, I can, you know, <laughs> I can tell you for a fact that uh, that has been a, a significant improvement on my side and, and has allowed me um, to do a much better job in, in innovation and, and lower stress levels acro across the across the board. When everybody knows exactly what it is that you're talking about, things get much, much easier for everybody. Yeah, and if I can add in, you know, definitely agree with what Eduardo had there. I mean, he's... He's been here for a little bit longer, but from my perspective, just being here for, you know, uh, a few months, right? Like, I think goes back to one of the quotes that Joan had, you know, we're not here to leave engineering. We're here to lead engineering. And, you know, I, I, I gave the very detailed description of the program that I'm here attending to one of my sisters back home in Iowa. And after my, you know, minute to two minute spiel, she basically said, oh, so you're going to be an engineer with people skills. And that's an oversimplification. But, you know, like you like you said, Karan, we're, we're going to maintain our technical expertise. Like Eduardo said, we're preparing technical responses. But at the same time, we're going to be able to work well with people. We're, we are in Sloan management classes, honing our public speaking presentation skills, teamwork skills. So all, all the above. Um, Thank you. So oh, sorry, if, if, if I may actually uh, kind of like following Please. up a little bit on that, th there are multiple questions about the role of experience, right? Like how uh, uh, few years, how many years uh, does it make sense? I would ask, what's the role of exper professional experience uh, how does it that play a role into the SEM um, uh, engagement as a student? 
Hero, do you, do you want to take that? I'm sorry, we didn't give you a chance to chime in on the previous one. Okay. So you see me how the role, pre previous role contribute to the SDM, SDM society, you mean, the Ignatia? Oh, let, let me try to make it simple because I was thinking of something else. Um, for people who are applying to the program, um, what do you think is the role that professional experience plays uh, when you are actually engaged as an SEM student? Like when you look at the cohort, how relevant is the experience that they have? How much, how little? Oh, uh, yeah. So I would say the each cohort, like members' backgrounds, is totally different. Like for me, like automotive, uh, some are aerospace, like, you know, the like government, and so totally different. So my like you know as far as i know the everyone has a strong technical skill or at least the deep knowledge about the industry so that would be a relevant skill uh, to bring the sdm cohort yeah and i think um i was i was on the lower end of of years of experience i think the average when i applied was around seven uh maybe more and i was uh at sitting around five um, I, I think you want to come in with a story and, and have a very clear, um, I don't want to say game plan, but a, a very clear skill set that you know that you could provide to your teammates and your colleagues. Um, it, it, you know, you could have 20 years of experience, but if, if you don't know how to, uh, transmit some of your skill set or some of your contacts, knowledge, wherever it is to, to your teammates, it's not necessarily very useful. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, the experience requirement there or, you know, guidelines are, are there for a reason, I think. I mean, when I did my, my first master's in civil engineering, I didn't really have too much civil engineering experience and like, it was still beneficial, but I didn't have a ton of context to, to apply to my studies. Whereas, you know, coming into this with some experience from the real world, and like Hiro said, you know, some of us are kind of siloed in specific industries, right? I've only been in the Coast Guard for the last 12 years. And, but when I, when we come in with the experience and we can kind of couch some of the things that are being taught in class and share examples, and we can share examples, right? Like Hero share, can share examples with me about Toyota. I can share examples with Hero, Hero about my civil engineering management in the Coast Guard. Um, you know, I had another classmate who was teaching me about how he uses AI in John Deere, you know, broadcast spreaders to remove weeds in the field at, you know, 20 miles an hour, just, you know, crazy things that I would never, my perspective would never be, be brought into that without, him having come into the program with some type of experience. So I think it's been helpful. Um, I'm going just to keep going. <laughs> um, Thank, you. Thank you, Ignacio. No problem. Um, actually, I want to try something different. Uh, Dana Owens has a question that I can just like say it over here, but Dana, if you are Okay, unmuting and just like going to your question about the traditional systems architecture design. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm mainly just interested in, in what systems design means in the context of this program. Um, and in my own interest, I'm, I'm interested in whether it's going to overlap with the work experience I already have. So for some context, for, for those who didn't see my previous question, um, as of right now, I'm working as a solutions architect at AWS. And so I do a lot of design work. Um, so I'm just curious, yeah, what systems design means in the program, what the technical classes would look like, um, and whether or not, in, in your opinion, it would overlap too heavily with a role that I'm in right now, or um, the classes would be very different from that work experience. Can Joan want me to grab that? Yeah, Brian, if you don't mind, and do a quick introduction if you could. I think people saw you on the uh, video, but if you don't mind giving a quick introduction. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm actually in uh, Japan tonight, so I'm a little bit may look sleepy. Um, but I'm Brian, and I'm the academic director. And uh, I was in at MIT as a student a long time ago. I was in industry for 25 years, including starting my own firm. 
software company. And I came back to start teaching uh, about 10 years ago, and I've been working with Joan uh, as the academic director of STM. And I lead the core classes that uh, Zach and, and Hito and uh, Ed were talking about. It's a great question. And, um, and I think what you'll find, I, and I'm curious what the current students have to say, and Zach really mentioned it, um, each industry has not only their own vocabulary, but their own conventions and even ways of seeing the world. And even though we may be quite self-confident, you know, if I've had a career for 10 years, I was in automotive and in aerospace. And, you know, I met a lot of really amazing engineers, but suddenly moving to a different industry, it was like being in a foreign land. So what we try to do in the curriculum is designed to it is to together discover the underlying principles that are true, no matter what we call them. And so that will strengthen you both in AWS as a solution architect or systems architect, but more importantly, broaden, I hope, um, your capability uh, to see the world of systems and to think about the principles of design, the principles of architecture, uh, the skills of, of uh, decomposition and reintegration and synthesis, understanding what model building is, understanding what it means to have confidence in a model and on and on and on. So these are things that are true, whether we're in healthcare or in energy or in agriculture uh, or in software. So I, does that I, does that answer your question at all? Yeah, thank you. Good question. We think about it a lot, actually. Arigato, Brian. Did I say it right? Anyway, no, never mind. Um, so uh, there is another question for the panel. Um, could you share a moment where you think your past professional experience contributed to the class beyond the ones that you already shared? Yeah, I can jump on the question. So previously I was working on as an engineer, but uh, I had an opportunity working with a lot of diverse people, like, you know, cultural difference, also background difference. So that, uh, the situation is happening here at MITSDM as a team uh, assignment. So everyone's background is different. So I'm trying to maximize the uh, result based on their pro professionalities. So I think that I see some similarities here. So I'll be the, that'll be the, my you know, past, uh, you know, professional experience that contribute to uh, society right now. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, for myself, one quick example was, you know, in previous roles with the Coast Guard, I've been a, a design engineer specializing in civil engineering. And in that role, I had to go out and at different civil engineering sites, there would be a problem. and we would need to figure out a solution to design to address that problem for the, the Coast Guard members who were using that facility to accomplish our missions. And in doing so, even though at the time I didn't really know that I was doing it, I was defining what the solution neutral function of whatever it was that I was working on, the system problem statement, all of these things that we're actually diving into right now in this first semester of core, kind of going back to, to Dana's question about, you know, whether it's, go it's going to be applicable to, you know, her current role as a system architect or, <clears throat> or things like that. I mean, to kind of go back and piggyback on what Dr. Mosier said, right? Like, we're almost going back up a level into these principles, higher level understanding what the foundation is. And once we all get on that level and and we can kind of speak the same language, it's applicable across almost all disciplines. So uh, that that's one quick example where I used some of my previous civil engineering experience here in the core. I want to... I'm looking at the time and I want to be mindful of the fact that our students are are offering to jump in and volunteer, but this is also a 
day with classes. Um, if you can stay for a few extra minutes, we'll take Q&A for probably another five or 10 minutes. But if you need to step away, please don't hesitate to step away and head to class because I know that that you do have other conflicts that are are going today. And I, I thank you tremendously for joining us. It, it makes a big difference here for your perspectives. Um, Ignacio, we'll take a couple more questions. And I do wanna let everybody know that we are here, um, Amali Lalam, who is on here, I know that she's posted or will put up in the chat an email address so that if there's any follow-up questions, she can help route you to the right people to help answer that. Um, but let's take one or two more, Ignacio, if you've got anything else that you think might be um, good to grab among the whole group before we we um, say goodbye for the morning. Actually, Karan has raised his hand. So Karan, please feel free to jump on. Hey there. Um, it's a great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, I have been checking out the MIT open courseware. Love those um, course sessions, especially the design thinking uh, recordings. Um, I wanted to ask system design as, you know, I forget the person's name, um, the person before um, specified how it ties across multiple industries. And sometimes there's frameworks or architecture or terminology that is specific to an industry, but system design itself uh, the principles of it apply across industries. Um, I wanted to ask in context of the course, design thinking is where does, you know, just put that in a map of the course for me. Or is that like the goal? Is that, are we starting there and where are we going? That kind of question. Thank you. That, uh, go ahead, Eduardo. Sure. <laughs> okay. I'll go ahead. Uh, design thinking. I think um, you, you mentioned a couple of key words, core, design thinking, where do we go from there? Uh, I'll put design thinking at the very center of anything you're doing. Any, if, Even if it's a financial system, right? As a manager, you might be thinking of how you're going to fund the project that you're working on and so on. Uh, it, it's, and as Brian had alluded to before, it, it's it, the core is going to give you design principles that are somewhat universal and that they're not geared to any one particular topic or any one particular industry. Uh, so in short, really, the design thinking is at, at the very core of you, at least my practice now. I guess I've, I've been in SDM for two years and now I, I, I haven't been able to get it out of my head. Um, and <laughs> yeah. Nice. And, even I, I've now taken it to designing my MIT experience. <laughs> so <laughs> hope that answers your question. Thank you. I see Good another tenure. question from Christian. I think that I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. No worries. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you for your this fantastic presentation. My name is Christian Garcia. Um, I had a quick question, and I just wanted to say briefly about myself. I'm in, located in Toronto. I work for um, a fintech company that's based, uh, that primarily focuses on AI customer experience. And before joining this, pivoting my career into the fintech space, I was with uh, big financial institutions for 10 years, over 10 years. My question, as I was looking at the diversity and in um, the variety of the experience of, of the class, and I'm interested in the SDM certificate program. Um, I couldn't help but notice that there isn't a lot of folks that are coming from financial services. Um, I'm really passionate about driving innovation in this sector and my current role allows me to speak to clients around the world. And so I'm just curious if this program could be a good fit for someone who has um, my background, and by the way, I, I'm not an engineer, but I've been in IT roles, process optimization roles, and I've managed a lot of operations, and now I'm trying to drive innovation with clients. But I was just curious in terms of that breadth and depth of representation, if this is a program that could be a good fit for um, someone with financial services industry background. Thank you. I'll jump in there for, for just a couple of comments. Um, we do have typically one or two a year. We don't have a huge representation from, from the financial services sector. And I, I, you know, I, I look at FinTech and the financial services, I think people that we get in from finance are, are coming in from that side, but we routinely have a couple. So it may not be broad representation, but you definitely will find that there's a th thread there and there are um, 
there are alumni, there are, are um, courses that can really help fill out in that area. Brian, do you want to add anything additional to that? Well, I think I think that's right, um, Christian. That uh, it depends on your intent. So, if if your intention is to stay very specifically in the kind of role or niche that you have, and you already have that experience, then I'm not sure this would make a huge difference for you. What we've seen in in not only in fintech but finance is just the the number of trends that are occurring that are that have really been shaping and changing the industry and especially industries connecting this to other industries and so uh you know a fair number of people who come from finance in fact a student who actually works for me now uh, in a company um came from he was with city for years and years and he wanted to get back into on the investment side into looking at uh certain classes of new technology investments and so forth so, so it depends on your intent, so, because if you want to really stay narrowly in finance or in fintech, pardon me, then there are other, there's an MFIN degree and there's other degrees that one can also take a look at uh, while you're at MIT. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. And the, and the intent is definitely to broaden out of, um, out of that field. So I appreciate definitely your insights. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I, and I do think the fields, I mean, it's, it's all going to change faster as, as you get older, you, you know, it's going to change faster than we can keep up with. So. It's a lot of opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ignacio, any last question that you think would be useful from the panel before we, we wrap up? Uh, no, I think that we pretty much covered it all, at least at the most, the, the largest trends, let's say. Great. I wanna thank the students. I wanna thank Eduardo, Hero, Zach. I know it's, it's you know, you're giving up a chunk of time on a school day and I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the the, all of you for joining us today. We have a lot of information on our website. Uh, we are here. We've we've got a, a small dedicated team that's here to make sure that we can answer the questions so that you can figure out if this program is the right fit for you. And so please tap into us, explore that. We want to make sure that if you choose to apply to SDM, that we've got the right fit, that it it is the right direction for you, and then happy to work with you through the admissions process. So thank you so much for your time today. If you've got further questions, please follow up with them all. She'll get any one of us involved that's the right person to help answer your questions. So thank you so much for your time and um, hope to meet some of you um, in a little bit more depth sometime soon. So take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.